So we're here today. Governor McKee is joined today by Director Alvedi, Colonel Weaver, Commerce Secretary Tanner, Director of Administration Warmer, Office of Budget and Management Director Daniels. We wanted to provide an update on the ongoing activities surrounding the construction of the westbound Washington Bridge and the status of the procurement of construction contacts, contracts. In addition to frequent meetings with the Department of Transportation, the government has established weekly meetings with the cabinet members present here today. I would ask that you hold questions until the conclusion of remarks, at which time we'll provide ample time for follow-up questions. At this time, I'd like to introduce Governor McKee for his remarks. Well, thank you, Joe, and, and thanks for everybody being here and anyone that's listening in. Uh, we really uh, wanted to kind of uh, uh, put together a what we do on a weekly basis uh, relative to the Washington Bridge with the team that's here with me and, and also other, other factors that are discussed every week. So, you know, we're focused on a strategy that started in December 11th going forward. Uh, you know, our legal team has taken December 11th and moving backwards. Uh, and uh, we're here today to talk about December 11th moving or going forward. So I've tasked this team with continuing improvements on to the traffic flow, uh, the reconstructing of a new bridge that will outlast our lifetimes, identifying funding sources and providing assistance uh, to impacted businesses. To date, we've been able to open up the three lanes of traffic in both directions on the eastbound bridge to alleviate uh, congestion. We continue to review traffic and accident data every week, and you'll hear some of that today, the updated information, uh, to identify any opportunities to further improve the traffic flow. We've established a funding mechanism for the demolition and the construction projects, and we're continuing to seek additional federal support. We've allocated dollars in the budget uh, to support local businesses, uh, working with our General Assembly members. Thank you to the Speaker and the Senate President. And we continue to work closely with the State Police and DOT on enforcement measures to reduce accidents, and you'll hear, see the accidents reports today, and improve the flow of traffic. We've secured a bidder for the demolition of the old bridge, uh, which is the first step in building a brand new bridge that will outlast our lifetimes. And now we will continue to work on securing a successful contract uh, and to start to the design and construction process. Uh, just like many of you read in the news a few weeks ago, only one company submitted re uh, questions to our state purchasing department about the bridge reconstruction project. Uh, that was an indication to us that we may not get the level of response on the RFP that we originally had hoped for. And because that was ultimately the outcome, the state will now be issuing an RFI, a request for information, uh, to get direct input from companies in this industry. I've asked our teams at the Department of Administration and DOT to work quickly to craft and issue the RFI. While we continue these efforts, we have a team of outside attorneys who are focusing on everything that happened prior to December 11th. And they are working with experts to continue developing a forensic report which will determine who they can hold accountable through the legal process. They are leaving no stone unturned. Uh, we met with them yesterday, and uh, as a result of that, I, I think you have posted that they're going to make a, a, a press availability tomorrow morning at 1030 on our request. And as our goal is to make the best case possible on behalf of the taxpayers on the legal process, we are heeding the attorney's expert advice when it comes to the timing of sharing the forensic report or any reports. The attorneys will be making themselves available to the media, as I said, tomorrow to answer questions related to the ongoing work. And that's my opening comments, but I'll hand it back to Joe to keep the, keep the ball rolling here. Thank you. I'm going to bring up Director Albedi uh, to present an update on next steps for the demolition project that's about to begin and to talk about procurement of a contract to design and reconstruct the new bridge and it also be presenting uh, updated traffic data and mediation, traffic mediation measures that we've taken to date. Thanks, Joe. 
Hi, everyone. I want, I want to start out by saying that um, at DOT, our first and, and foremost concerns begin and end with the public's anxieties, their inconveniences, um, and the knowledge that um, they've expressed urgency for us to find solutions uh, quickly and rebuild the bridge. That concept leads the way for us. That's why we've made um, improving the driving experience and lessening the congestion and preparing for the reconstruction of this bridge an absolute priority at DOT. We've worked, our folks have worked diligently at providing a functional um, traffic pattern right now that we have in place uh, that people are using today daily. Traffic times have been brought down to close to what they were previously. The accident rates are about the same as what they were previous to uh, the closure of the Washington Bridge. Um, but at the same time, that's not the same as giving Rhode Islanders a new bridge uh, that they need. Um, it's been hard for those that use the bridge daily. We understand that. And that's why we took a very aggressive approach on the creation of the terms in our uh, request for proposal. And as you know, there were no bidders. Several factors, we believe, uh, played into that response. First, the RFP had a very aggressive response schedule, not only for the RFP itself and responding to the RFP, but also the schedule to complete the project was very aggressive. Um, and there were uh, substantial penalties, as you all know, to uh, associated with meeting those schedules during the project. We asked the bidders to assume more risk than normal, to hold them to a very high accountability standard. Um, and there are competing interests in the New England regional um, construction market. There's a lot of work that's out there. And um, other, other agencies are competing for the same group to do that work. Um, and we can't discount the high level of scrutiny and attention that this has been getting and um, the atmosphere of controversy around this project that may have affected some of, uh, some of the people. So we're doing our very best to address the concerns of the people who want us to move quickly on this and to hold our contractors at very high level of standards and to set a high bar for these contractors in meeting their responsibilities. In this RFP, we push the envelope apparently beyond what the construction industry is willing to bear. We accept that. But we're not going to be discouraged. We're moving forward with plans to readjust and move forward to continue to help commuters get the new bridge that they need and to get them back to life as normal pre-bridge closure. Uh, the first step in that process, as the governor mentioned, is to confirm why the companies didn't come forward, to confirm that. And uh, we'll be implementing a request for information on RFI process um, that will allow us to collect the information that we need in order to precisely understand what the uh, resistance to the construction industry was in the original RFP and to help us create uh, a new RFP that will conform more to what the industry finds acceptable. Uh, through this process, 
we're going to identify the pressure points, provide a path forward, and provide the information and have it provide the information that we need for our new procurement process. Um, at the same time, we're going to continue to work on finding solutions for, to make commuters um, have a faster and better commute across the bridge. Um, I want to assure folks that the schedule for demolition is moving ahead on time. We expect that to be awarded formally on July 17th and the demolition project will begin that very same day. And our mission is to award the reconstruction contract so that work on the reconstruction can begin uh, before or shortly after the completion of the demolition contract. So that continues to be a priority at DOT. Uh, governor's asked me to review with you some of the data that we, our department exchanges with him on a weekly basis in terms of the traffic situation that we continue to work on. Um, here you see uh, a chart uh, that plots the, uh, the, da yes. the dotted line that you see or the dashed line that you see is the traffic times, the travel times, from three different areas. Uh, one in the morning, uh, eastbound on 95, uh, from uh, 95 north on to 195 to the, I'm sorry, to the, um, to the state border. The other from 95 south on to 195 east uh, to the um, Massachusetts border. And the, and the other in the westerly direction, the opposite direction. You'll notice that, uh, if you can go back up a little, the, the travel times are approximating right now. Prior to closure of schools, uh, in the easterly direction, in the AM peak, uh, we had about a five minute differential during the week. On weekends, a little less or about equal to what it was pre-bridge closure. Now that schools have let out, you can see that the actuals that we're experiencing now are about the same as the pre-bridge uh, closure. Coming from 95 South, different matter. Um, prior to uh, school closures, the differential was between five and 10 minutes uh, in the AM peak. Um, and since then, it's reduced down to five minutes, but it is still a bit longer in the easterly direction coming from 95 South uh, than it was prior to. We're working on that. That's the one that we're working on to bring those, uh, the, those actual times experience now back down. And our engineers are working with several consultants to model and look at various alternatives that we can potentially use. Um, in the Wesley direction, the opposite is true. We actually reduced, uh, prior to school letting out, uh, we reduced the times of travel by about five to seven minutes uh, during the AM peak in the westerly direction uh, on an average basis. And now that we are um, in the summer months, we see them closely approximating or slightly less than what the travel times were in the westerly direction uh, prior to the closure of the bridge. The next set of charts is the PM peak. And you can see the, the PM peak um, is a little bit more exaggerated. Uh, that is, the travel times are a bit longer in the PM peak than they were prior to the closure of the bridge, anywhere between uh, coming from 95 north, uh, anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes, and in the PM peak from coming from 95 uh, south, uh, they're anywhere where from 5 to uh, 15 minutes. Again, even in the PM peak, the travel times in the westerly direction are actually less on the average than they were before. So if you go in both directions, they both balance out. Next slide. 
These are just maps of the travel routes. Um, these are the traffic volumes. The monthly average traffic <laughs> volumes uh, shown in the dash line of about 80,000 vehicles in each direction in the, in the westerly bound, it's a little more than 80, about 82,000 vehicles per day prior to the big bridge closure. And you can see over time that those lines are converging, particularly now that we're in the summer months, they're getting even closer to what they were prior to uh, the bridge closure. So uh, the travel times are coming down since the closure of the bridge. The amount of traffic is going up to back. People are assuming the same traffic patterns that they, they were taking prior to the bridge closure. Next. Accident rates, um, we're doing pretty well on. Um, the accident rates, depending upon the week, there was an anomaly on one week, but pretty much um, the actual number of accidents happening now is equal to or less than uh, what it was prior to bridge closure in the easterly direction. And in the westerly direction, it's consistently less than what it was prior to the bridge closure. Next. The, um, the severity of, of cra crashes are largely non-injury uh, crashes. They're property damage only. And the types of accidents are generally uh, the almost exclusively sideswipe or rear end. About half of them are rear end collisions. Next. This is, uh, this is a chart of accidents from the closure of the bridge, you can see that there was much higher than what was previously experienced, uh, to now the trend is downward to where we're coming uh, equal to or better than what we were before the bridge was closed with the accident rates. In both east and west directions are trending downward, even more exaggerated in the westerly direction that has declined substantially. Uh, locations of the accidents I primarily right now in and around with the two lanes from north and uh, 95 north and south merge on to 195 east. Um, a good number of accidents happen at those locations. Other clusters we see in and around the interchanges of on ramps and off ramps. That's about it for the traffic and that's pretty much the briefing that we give to the to the governor and now to you on a weekly basis. I'm going to ask Secretary Tanner to come up and present to you an update of Commerce's assistance to the businesses in East Providence and Providence that have been impacted by the bridge closure. Thank you, Joe. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to provide a couple of updates regarding affected businesses. Uh, first, I wanted to touch on what we're hearing from the businesses. Just a few weeks ago, I personally went out and spoke to uh, a bunch of businesses in East Providence to hear what they had to say. Uh, I'll say that while they all say that they really appreciate the support that the local businesses and the local customers have given to them, uh, but they're really looking for more assistance from their, lo from their locals. The, that's what they're really asking us for. Uh, they want more of the return of the local customers. Um, for example, we were out at Vargas Auto Services in Gilmore's Flower Shop, and while they've increased some activity, they want the support of everyone, uh, not just their locals, but they're looking for folks outside. I was also over at El Mariachi, uh, the restaurant, and they've pivoted some of their business model to increase their takeout sales, which has done very well for them. Um, and so they and many other local businesses have been smart about pivoting some of their models um, to find creative ways and solutions to increase their businesses. So we, we applaud them and we want to support them and to continue to support them. Next, I want to point out um, our marketing campaign. Uh, another way we can support businesses is by going online to buylocalri.org. Um, and so that website's been created with the help of the Providence Warwick Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, we've added Providence and East Providence businesses to that website to increase business traffic for them. Um, and since launching that media campaign um, in May, the website has received over 30,000 clicks and a web traffic is up 200%. So a lot of that traffic at Buy Local 
ri.org is a result of the advertising that we've been doing with them at Commerce, and I hope that everyone will support that as well. And overall, the multimedia campaign has received more than two, 22 million impressions since we started, so um, great success in that area as well. And finally, uh, Commerce is working very closely with the cities of East Providence and Providence to finalize the parameters of our grants and other support that might be offered. Uh, as you know, $2.6 million has been designated for those businesses impacted by the Washington Bridge reconstruction, and that's $1.2 million that goes to East Providence, $800,000 that goes to Providence, and $600,000 that comes to the state through Commerce to uh, assist all of the other affected businesses um, outside of East Providence and Providence. The cities may use and are discussing uh, using more of their funds, not just for grants, but for other additional supports, um, but they are working on trying to decide what to do right now. Uh, just for those who might be interested, both for-profits and not-for-profit businesses will be eligible for grants uh, with a few exceptions, and we can provide those to you separately. Um, the applications for East Providence, Providence, and the entire state uh, will be available by the end of the summer. That's what we're aiming for. Uh, some of us have some processes to set up and people to work on setting those uh, programs up. And so businesses who are looking for more information or who will be interested in applying, uh, please know that at Rhode Island Commerce, we will be making sure that every single Chamber of Commerce in Rhode Island has all of that information, uh, particularly the Providence and East Providence Chambers of Commerce, um, and we'll be sharing it widely ourselves. And if you would like to kind of keep up to date on where things are at, please follow us on all of our social media channels. And with that, I'll turn it back to Joe. Thank you very much. So in addition to the remarks presented today, we do have Colonel Weaver here who will take any questions related to traffic issues and the enforcement measures that are underway. Uh, it is important to note as we close this out that the state's procurement and bid solicitation is a statutory scheme that's administered independently of the governor's office. Uh, Director Warmer will be available to take questions related to that procurement process. In addition, Director Daniels can respond to questions about funding for the project uh, to date. So I'm going to have Andrea come up and take whatever questions. Just please identify who your question is for. Yes, I'm going to start right over here with Chris. Um, I guess my question is for the governor and or Director Alviti, specifically just about the lack of bids. There have been mentions of, well, a variety of factors, but could one of those factors just be the fact that 12 companies are put on notice that they might get sued over previous work? I think that uh, the director explained uh, the reason that uh, we believe that uh, you didn't get um, responses. Um, and uh, I'll leave that at, as, as, as the director said. I think that the uh, any of the legal issues will be you can address that with the legal legal team tomorrow. Uh, Peter, why is, you you knew that nobody going to be coming forward to build that bridge with the <laughs> timeline that you guys put out? What is the new timeline? Because I heard nothing regarding we're going to build the bridge in the next three to five years. Governor won the bridge in two years because of re-election. Realistic, what is the real time to, be, to build that bridge? The real time will be when the contractor has uh, been on it and proposed a schedule, and that schedule is accepted. Um, the schedules that we put together are schedules that we put together on many other jobs that we've done, over 300 bridges in the last eight years. And all of those, we've used the industry standards. I think... Uh, we did not know that, I, it's not that I think, we did not know that we were going to get no response. I think we were overly ambitious in the, not only that one factor, uh, but also with regard to the accelerated time frame, with the assignment of risk that we tried to uh, make the contractors uh, perform at a higher level bar than we normally do. We did all of this as a response to the kind of messaging that we've been hearing from all of you, all of the, um, all of the people involved. 
Uh, the citizens of the state of Rhode Island want us to get the best performance that we can out of these contractors. We owe it to them to try and get that, which means holding them to a high standard of accountability for their responsibilities and getting the work done as fast as, as possible. We set that bar too high, too high, I said that. We accept that. And um, we will engage with the industry to understand where we need to reset those bars in order to get a good competitive outcome. Um, well, a quick follow-up to that. Do you have a timeline that you're hoping for? When is the new RFP going out? The, the, um, the RFI is going out, as the governor said, as soon as possible. And our folks are already working on that. They're already drafting it uh, to go out, and we'll get that out as soon as possible. The RFP scheduled and the schedule of the ensuing project for the contract that we select will be uh, better refined through the RFI process. Part of what I said is that apparently we set the timeline that we did um, more aggressive than some of the companies would like, or all of the companies would like. So we are looking to readjust that according to the feedback we get through the request for information process that we'll be going through. Um, as I said, the, um, I'm not going to speculate as to the time. I think the, the request for information will help us find the acceptable time frame that companies will need in order to execute the process and create a competitive environment. That's the target we'll be aiming at. It's still going to be um, a target that we press aggressively to get it done as soon as we possibly can. confident are you that August 2026 is still a realistic timeline for a new bridge? After hearing all this, is your confidence wavering on that? The time frame is going to be what it is when the RFP comes out, and I would appreciate if you do follow uh, our professionals that are here and not overstepping them uh, the way you just did, Tim. Why? So what I'm just telling you Why? is that we're going to know where the timeline is when we get the timeline. Uh, what was projected, as Peter said, was a timeline that, w w that was felt, or the people, you know, as, as the RFP was, was developed, uh, that was a timeline uh, that uh, was b uh, believed to be a, a timeline that they could live with. So now they're going to go out with another RFP. We'll find out when we get the bids back in terms of what the timeline is. Do you regret knowing what you know now with no bids that you didn't? put out an RFI before the past RFP? And also, how much did the state spend on this failed RFP? So the, um, we don't have regrets at DOT. We adjust according to what the market and the uh, facts tell us to. The fact is that we now know um, that we, were, we had an aggressive timeline in a number of other aggressive kinds of things. We took that stance based on uh, consultation with our owner's representative, consulting engineers that we had and other experts. Um, we had the FHWA involved in the process through the entire process with us in developing that scope and, and schedule. Um, the timelines are normal and customary. It's timelines that we have used on other projects in being aggressive. I think um, that timeline combined with the other factors, not in and of them itself, but the uh, other factors that are available, um, combined created a more chilling effect on the participation. Um, we'll correct that now with an, with an RFI. We'll get the RFI out, we'll seek the information from the individual companies as to what aspects of that RFI they found challenging or too challenging to participate. Um, and then we'll refine our process on that. How much did the state, take, uh, did the state spend on this RFP process? I, I, we'll, 
we could certainly put that number to get together for you. Just real quickly, are we still looking at three hundred million dollars for the project, or do we expect that number now even to go up through the pipes now? I think I, I I've said a number of times since we issued the RFP and the estimates, the original estimates were made, that the ultimate determinant of project cost will be the bidding process. The the market will govern what the actual cost is. And I've said that over and over again. That, that, that was an engineering estimate based on industry standards. Is that still the same? It, it currently remains the same. But as I said, that's conditional upon uh, what the market bears. And there are a number of factors that are putting pressure on the market, not the least of which the abundance of work that's available right now and how that might affect an escalating cost to the project when contractors are very busy, uh, new projects that they bid on tend to be a bit higher than normal. But um, we'll see what that is, and the final determinant of that cost will be the, when the bids come in. Was it realistic to put in a deadline, to give out a deadline at all on the bridge on when anything would really happen, when it seems like where we are now is that deadline could just keep getting pushed back? No. It won't get keep getting pushed back. We are going to continue. How do we know that if we don't we, even have a deadline. Well, because a goal. because as I said, the first step in that process is to begin a conversation with some of the non-participants, and to find out whether or not the schedule that we set was the defining factor in their not participating, or was it other things? The outcome of that RFI and what we find in those discussions will help us redefine, if we have to, any schedule. We may not have to. Governor, back in March, you told us that we would see accountability for this situation. When will we see that accountability? I think you can ask the legal team tomorrow at 1030. Um, for Mr. Avaidi, so if just for accurate reporting, in this case, that uh, September 2026 limit, it's off the table, considering the response or non-response from the companies? No, I think we said that the RFI process and ultimately the response to the new RFP will define the timeline and the cost of this project. And we need to wait to see what the, those results are prior to making any commitment. Quick question for the director and the, the governor. The demolition contract specifies coordination between the demo contractor mm -hmm. and the design build contractor mm -hmm. and has aggressive incentives based on hitting the timelines. Is the fact that you don't have a design build contractor and have no timeline for getting one going to alter or um, make require changes in the demo contract because they can't hit those? No, absolutely not. It will not require changes in the demo contract. In fact, it makes the demo contract, particularly since we, um, we awarded it to a company that's going to get it done 50 days sooner, will now serve as a very concrete kind of basis for companies in the new RFP process to base their scheduling on. Now we have, prior to, prior to this being awarded, um, or actually being awarded in, uh, by the 17th of this month. Once that award is made, the new RFP and the competitors in that RFP process will have less risk in their assumptions that they need to make with regard to the completion of the demolition contract. It'll be fixed in a contract and the timelines will be fixed and all of the risk associated with that will be eliminated. I think that's one element of so risk that we'll be able to eliminate contract. as part of the new RFP you process. Know, just say, we, we have these incentives, you have to give them to us now because the contract said we are going to be able to coordinate with the design right. build contractor. Now they can say you already you messed up that part of it already, give right. us the incentives no matter what. Well, we, we expect and our mission is, as I said before, to get the new RFP out and the contract for uh, design build awarded prior to the completion of that contract. For the, for the governor, in March, when you announced that the bridge is going to have to be torn down, 
I, I asked whether you had considered going under an emergency contract with the contractor that was already working on the bridge, and I think is still on the bridge and their equipment, and you said, no, this will get us a better deal if we go out to bid under a new RFP. Now, that appears to be wrong. Do you regret not going with an emergency contract with the existing contract? No, I think that the, uh, I think that, uh, the people on the state of Rhode Island expect to have an open process here and, and not to be contracting with somebody that potentially could have, you know, brought us to the problems that we're, that we're encountering right now. No, what I'm saying is an open bid process is what um, I believe was the, the right option. Uh, I'm not going to debate you on it. I'm, I'm telling you what I think and, uh, and, uh, is, the, is the fact that a competitive bid process on the bridge under the circumstances was the right move. And then the bid process, as Joe outlined, is outside the parameters of the governor's office and it's in, in, in the areas of the DOT and the DOA. So that process, you can ask them about the process relative to the reasons that they selected the, uh, the you know, the, the timelines that they did and the direction that they made. Uh, Governor McKee, with last week's no bid announcement and the subsequent lack of any construction ETA, it has become clear that the legacy of the McKee administration may well be the failure to properly inspect and repair the Washington Bridge on a timely basis. Is it time to walk away from electoral politics, abandon any attempt for a second full term, to focus the remainder of your time in office on resolving the bridge crisis? Yeah, so lo let's get the timeline straight. Uh, December 11th, when I made the, the, the decision to shut down the bridge, uh, the issues you just talked about predated December 11th. So as far as, that's why we have a legal team that is working on the issues, as I said in my opening comments, the legal team is working on things prior to December 11th, the accountability issue, the day of reckoning issue, and then what we're working on is from December 11th going forward. So I don't, I don't, I don't see the connection on what you just talked about. There's an entire generation, an entire economy in the East Bay that despite these statistics is largely abandoning hope. Is it time to walk away from politics and just simply run out your term and focus on getting this done? Because it, it appears that there's no end. This is going to get completed. Like I said, we're going to build a bridge that's going to outlast all the lifetimes. It's something that was handed to our administration, to me, on December 11th. And we're moving forward to correct that issue. The issues that have to do that predated December 11th, I brought on an independent legal team to actually pursue that so that there'd be no questions in the public's mind about the fact that there'll be no stone unturned. Um, either governor or the director, with the question and answer process that we've been reading through now, um, if there was only one vendor reaching out this entire time, um, why not take them up on the opportunity to meet in person or consider changing the procurement process sooner than you are now? Right. We could understand we couldn't do that during the procurement process because it would be improper for us to meet one-on-one -on -one with any particular company that was competing for it that would provide an unfair advantage. Now that we're out of it, we're going into a, a procedure that is a request for information. We can open that up to not only that company, but other companies who took a look at the bid package and decided for various reasons, one or the other or collectively of all the things that I mentioned, why they wouldn't participate. Now we will be opening the doors to all of those companies to come in and ask questions and exchange ideas. Were there any last minute bids submitted? No, all of the bids were due on the due date and no bids were received. Governor, to Ian's question about um, the forensic analysis, the legal report coming out. You said Max Wistow has a press conference tomorrow at 10.30. Seven months in, is it more in focus to you now? Do you have a sense as to what went wrong with the bridge? Do you have any insight at no, all? Again, Tim, we're, as I said, we're taking advice from our legal team. I brought on a legal team that has experience in terms of pursuing accountability. I, I, I have to defer to them. No, I get, I get you're deferring to them, but yes. even if you don't tell us what it is, do you know? I'm going to defer to them in terms of dealing, the, you know, having them do the, their job that I brought them on to do, which is to hold anyone accountable uh, that should be held accountable 
uh, prior to the time frame where I uh, made the decision to, sh to close the bridge. <laughs> okay, I've got a question, and I apologize. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when I talked to Max Wistow, he was unclear whether the forensic analysis was going to be made public. He said basically that it's not his decision, which I assume in, in so many words, but I assume that means it's the decision of the governor. Is that report going to be public, or is it going to be withheld? as an investigatory legal strategy? That's a question for, I have answered that. We're gonna follow the attorney's advice, just like any client should follow their attorney's advice or fire that attorney, right? So we're not, we're, we, we're confident that we have a good legal team to hold people accountable relative, relative to accountability in terms of, the, in terms of the, the, the condition of the bridge at that moment in time on December 11th. Uh, when I made the decision to close the bridge. So that we're going to follow the legal advice. I think that you should, you know, certainly I would imagine that some people in this room will be somewhere with the attorneys tomorrow at 1030, and that's a question that uh, you should be asking, and that's the reason that I asked the legal team to be available uh, to uh, the media so that uh, those questions could be answered uh, from a professional point of view that uh, they're representing the state from. Yeah, and you can ask him that tomorrow. What I would, what I've said to him is that at the appropriate time, that report will be released. But I'm not going to release it until uh, my the legal representation that is working on the recovery for the taxpayers in the state of Rhode Island uh, makes that uh, you know makes you know closes their closes their out their um, work right, which is to ultimately uh, uh, have a, a financial. Uh, uh, consideration for uh, accountability and also if it reflects as we said in the no strun and turned uh, if it reflects into management then we'll we'll be reading that as well but uh, but you I think you need to, the questions you're asking me are really questions and that's why I asked the legal team to be available to the media uh, they did and they and I, I and I appreciate the fact that they'll be there answering that very question that you're asking today Kathy but would you agree that the end of the process could be years and years and years from now that's a question again for the legal team. Just like there's there's certain timelines that you're just not going to know what they are until you know what they are. But I'll tell you, we're not going to rush uh, the issue uh, there uh, and not protect the taxpayers if there is a financial recovery that could be had. Do you have the report? Just to finish my last question. Which report? The forensic analysis. No, I don't. No, I don't. Governor, this one is still for you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Governor, you have stood by Peter Alvidi, but let's go over some facts. Um, Rideout led a contract recently to repair the bridges at Route 6 in 95. Now, that contract is upwards of $500 million. There was only one bidder on that contract, and that was Skanska. So here, March 15th, going over what everyone has said, and you stood up here, said that your consultant said, this bridge is going to cost between 250 and $300 million that there's going to be an early finish of March 26 and a late finish of September 26. Is your administration competent in managing this project, and do you stand by Peter Alvarez, yes, director? Yes, we are. Thank you. Governor, I have to go back to the timeline. Um, and this, perhaps this is for the director as well. You said you won't know if the September 2026 finish is still stands until you do the RFI, but your original timeline said that the design would begin in August next month. So that's obviously not gonna happen. So we're just trying to give the public a sense of how much we're pushing this timeline. Is it a couple months? Is it six months? Again, uh, respectfully, we can't tell until RFPs are done, RFIs are done. That's, again, that's not, and, and this is not to pass along any any. But you're uh, not starting the design There's only month. a certain amount, and I'll, if you ask him on the RFP process, uh, you can talk to the dr director, uh, you know, Alvidi or, or, or Director Wama. That they, they would an answer that question, and then the, the response from the RFPs or the R RPI uh, will be um, will speak for themselves. We're we're 
the, the building a bridge obviously takes a while. Um, uh, the the bridge in Baltimore is going to take four to five years. So we'll be significantly, you know, in that, you know, in a, in a time frame that we'll know at a certain period of time. And we can't answer the question you're asking right now. So I apologize, but I can't answer what I don't know. And then is it? Do you think it's? Are you comfortable with demolishing the bridge before you have? a design, a plan, a contract to build a new one? Yes. Yeah, so surely this can't be the first time that the state's putting out an RFI. Can someone explain how long that process has taken before in other potentially similar projects? I know that the Washington Bridge is particularly complex, but we're just trying to get a sense of how long it could take for a typical project. So an RFI or a request for information is a pretty standard government practice to gather information from an industry. Uh, how complex you want to make that, how detailed you want to make that, how much time you want to let uh, that industry uh, contemplate before they get back to you is all flexible time periods. We're going to work with DOT uh, on, we're working on the drafting and making sure the process follows, you know, the rules. Uh, but, you know, that process isn't uh, the most complex process, certainly not as complex as putting out an RFP. Uh, you know, you're asking questions, you're gathering information, rather as much as giving information. And so the result is that process is going to be quicker uh, than the RFP process. Uh, once we have a, a timeline from DOT about specific dates, then we'll know. Uh, but I think as both the governor and the director have said, the real issue is what are they going to say? Well, can we expect an RFI by the end of July? Uh, I think that's uh, very probable. Uh, I actually have a question for Director Daniels. Um, just given the money that the state is pursuing from the federal government on this project, the mega grant, all the other buckets of money, does this new information about not knowing, A, even when an RFP is going out, and B, how much the project is going to cost negatively affect the state's ability to potentially tap into those dollars? Uh, no, I don't believe so, because the, the expectation that there's still a project scope uh, for the replacement of the bridge, that, what, that is what has been submitted in the, in the mega and infra bridge application. Um, there may be some changes to that, but the, the general fundamentals are the same. We know that we do need to replace the bridge, and there is a general cost estimate that is reasonable um, based on past experience and uh, information from the owner's rep. So I think that the, the application will still be strong and competitive. Um, I, don't, I don't imagine there will be much of a difference. Quickly, one for the governor and one for Director Alvedi. I'll start with the governor. Going back to the day of reckoning and the forensic report, seventh months in, and it's unclear exactly what went wrong, do you think that's deterring companies from wanting to work with the state? I, I think you have to companies for that, but I don't, I, I don't see it as a reason why we, we, we're, this is a normal process in, in, in construction, whether it has to do with state contracts or or, or you know, a private contracts. There's always an exchange between contractors, plus and minus. Sometimes they push for, you know, for uh, you know, judgment. Sometimes the, it's the reverse. So uh, this is a normal <laughs> practice in in the industry. Uh, I don't believe that it has any impact on the response. I think that the director laid out, um, you know, his reasoning in terms of the lack of response. And Director Alvedi, two months ago, the questions from the one interested company made it clear they had concerns about the scope, risks, and timeline of the project. Mm -hmm. So why didn't the state make adjustments then? Well, because we're in the middle of a procurement process, and you can't change the rules of engagement once the RFP goes out. You can't just arbitrarily change. I don't think the people of the state of Rhode Island would want DOT or any other department entering into an RFP, a public formal RFP that spells out exactly what the responses need to be and how they'll be assessed. You don't change the rules. There are laws against us changing the rules at midstream like that. We waited for that to uh, pro go through the process. We'll make those adjustments in the next RFP. I'm not going to speculate. Um, uh, there are no responses um, to the RFP. It's the very well I'm happened. not going. 
I'm not going to speculate. I don't, I don't do um, uh, speculation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Governor, final question. I used to work on the La Bridge in the station in 83. Right. Always a problem with the bridge. Yeah. Tell the people here, did you destroy the bridge yourself or you find out the bridge in that condition? Or Gina Raimundo went through the same issue, uh, Lincoln, Chaffee, some other governors went through the other issue, and everybody wanted to blame you. All I can say is on December 11th, I was given reasons why we should shut the bridge down. I felt the safety was far more important than any, any um, public perception. We, we, we safely, we kept people safe. We've moved forward since December 11th. And I've done the right thing as governor to bring on legal counsel uh, to determine where, if any, accountability lies. As whether it's financial or whether it's management. So, yes, I think that the timeline's important, and that's why I've mentioned, continually mentioned to the people who are listening uh, that December 11th was the day that I uh, was uh, responsible, and since then uh, we, have, we have managed that to, a to, to the best degree that we can. We always can do better, uh, but as far as prior to December 11th, as you're talking about, 1983, I don't, I don't think of 1983 will be in the scope of the legal work. I think that the the, uh, you know, the terms of uh, you know, accountability uh, expire at a certain time. By the way, we did ask the General Assembly to expand the, uh, the, the time frame. Uh, they chose not to. Uh, you know, they, certainly the legal team can talk to that tomorrow. We're doing everything in our power to address a very difficult issue that we know the people in the state of Rhode Island are suffering through. Uh, up to at this point in time, uh, we are going to proceed again, and I repeat over and over again, we're going to build a bridge that's going to outlast our lifetimes. That's my responsibility as a governor, and let the chips fall where they may.